I'll be honest with you guys. I think we've got to the point in the podcast whereby I'm inviting on the guests that I need to help me as well as help all of you. And so this week's guest is TJ Power. Now, TJ is the co-founder of Mindfully Empowered and spends all of his time educating, talking and training people on how to get productive, but also manage their mental health in this crazy world of social media. So he's an expert on our relationship with technology, our relationship with dopamine and our relationship with sleep and rest and how we need to unpick a formula that's going to help us navigate this incredibly complex world that we're operating. So it's a real pleasure to have TJ on. We talk about procrastination. We talk about getting outdoors. We talk about structure. We talk about wellness. We talk about, of course, our relationship with technology and his own journey with getting better sleep and getting more productive. No matter whether you're currently looking for a job, no matter whether you're currently in a job or running your own business, there's heaps of insights in this. So don't miss this one. And without further ado, welcome back to the Executive Career Jump podcast. This week, we've got TJ Power. Let's get to work. You're listening to the Career Jump podcast. Insights, interviews and success stories to inspire and give you the edge when you make your next career jump. Hosted by your career concierge, Andrew McCaskill. Hello, welcome back to the Executive Career Jump podcast. I'm your host and career concierge, Andrew McCaskill. Absolutely delighted today to be joined by TJ Power. At the time of recording this, we're just about to break up for uh, Christmas at the end of 2021. What a year 2021 has been. But TJ is a mind expert. And based on this year, I couldn't think of a better guest to be closing out the year with a conversation with. So firstly, thanks so much for joining us, TJ. It's great to have you here. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Very excited for this conversation. Happy to be with you. Yeah, no, we're really happy to have you with us. So I know you as the co-founder of Mindfully Empowered, but for the listeners who maybe haven't come across your work or your content before, tell us a little bit more about what you do for money and for a job. Yeah, so the majority of my work is largely training organizations and their employees with their mental health. So I've kind of, through my journey, I was lecturing at Exeter University and studying deep in kind of neuroscience and stuff. and try to really understand what about modern life is creating a shift in mental health across so many different people. And over a number of years, created this kind of eight-week training experience that I take companies through that empower employees with hopefully a really good understanding of what's going on and how to reorient their behavior to get them into a better space. No, I absolutely love that. I absolutely love that. And tell me what 2021 has been like for you. 2021 has definitely been the craziest year of my life, that's for sure. I, when, when COVID hit back in 2020, I, that's when I was still lecturing at Exeter and I went through this big transition trying to get these ideas to more and more people because I was seeing that the need was rising and 2021 has definitely been far beyond anything I was expecting. I feel very happy to have connected with so many people. I've had my own highs and lows as we've navigated through these complicated experiences. I think the times that we're in puts quite a level of strain on the mind. But overall, I feel like, yeah, definitely a very exciting year. Yeah, very good. And so what do you see as the pros and cons of going the self-employed or founder route versus working for other people having now taken the leap? Yeah, I definitely have quite enjoyed it. I really like working for myself with a few other people. I love having the control over my time, really. I always kind of struggled throughout school, kind of being told to go to this lesson and study this thing. And all throughout university, I kept dreaming of this time where I would kind of be in charge of my day of what I wanted to research and all these different things. And I've just had this like heavenly liberating experience over these last few years of just waking up and thinking like, what do I feel could be most important for people today? And it's been exciting. It also has come with its challenges, a lot of financial stuff to learn and understand, which has been a part of the journey. But yeah, it's been pretty cool. I mean, they could definitely make business ownership less complicated to encourage more, <laughs> more people to do it, couldn't they? A hundred percent. I have definitely had to pay for a lot of guidance from accountants and stuff like that to have a clue what on earth is going on with that side of things. But 
I now feel a bit more familiar with it. It's been a learning process. Yeah, well, great to hear that overall there's no regrets and that it's, you know, exceeded your expectations. One of the trends throughout the pandemic has been more and more people going that route. And, you know, as somebody who teaches people to be mindfully empowered, it sounds like you're also on that journey yourself, right? A hundred percent. I've been, it's been a very interesting experience because I work with some self-employed, some organizations, and I've definitely had to learn to kind of construct my days in a way that make them successful days. Because I think when you step out of the working world, you're kind of guided for you on what you should do and what would be valuable use of your time. And there's that period where you think, wow, I could do a lot less now. And then you start realizing, well, if I do less, then I'm not going to be very successful. So you go through that transition. And yeah, as I say, it's been pretty liberating trying to really think about how could I make a day that's going to be best? Because once you kind of step out of the constraints and you have to work these hours and those kind of things, I think you can make yourself pretty productive. I think we need more rest. That's what I've come to conclude than we necessarily get normally. Yeah. And why is rest important? I just think we're putting like more strain on the human mind than ever before. Obviously, we just have so much going on. We're consuming so much information. When we actually work on our computers now, it's crazy how much we're doing, conversations and emails and building stuff. And the mind is working at full, full capacity now. And I think a lot of the time we're exhausting it down to maybe 0% charge and being properly depleted giving ourselves these little tiny windows of rest and maybe getting it back up to 20% and then depleting it again and kind of staying in that lower band. And I think it's important to sometimes let yourself really recharge. And that's what I think Chris is going to be about, really trying to get ourselves to reset this system. We need a lot of energy to operate at the speed we're expected to now. Yeah, no, I can absolutely see that. And I'm feeling alongside a lot of people that I'm talking to really kind of, depleted right now i think the the lack of sunlight's a thing yeah huge you know like I, it, there's no doubt about it by the time you get to this point of the year you're well overdue a recharge aren't you 100 percent. and i think it's interesting because there's like two elements to this idea of tech influencing our mind and our mental health because one is obviously the tech can be quite overwhelming and can deplete this resource that we need so badly. In the same time as we spend so much time on the tech now, it's disconnecting us from a lot of the things that also make us feel good. So spending more time outdoors in sunlight, moving, connecting with people, all those things that we really need as humans. So there's like this balance. And I think this Christmas, and this is what we're going to be chatting about in our conversation today with Executive Career Jump, I think it's going to be really thinking, how can I approach this period to really try and recharge my batteries rather than well I'm not going to work but I'll just instead scroll my phone and social media and the news all day instead which doesn't actually allow the resource to rebuild. No absolutely well I'm looking forward to you talking to our members later. So what does good rest look like? What would a good program feel like in terms of somebody looking to recharge over a period of time? Yes so the big thing with this recharging our batteries is very much interconnected with dopamine. Dopamine is like the super famous buzzword now. And I think everyone is starting to recognize there must be a lot of dopamine in our world. And to kind of put dopamine simply, it's basically just like your driving force inside you. It's the survival chemical that drove us to be focused and motivated to create new ideas, to just keep us here on this planet and keep us innovating. And how dopamine is actually designed to work in our brains is we're basically expected to put a certain amount of effort in and then our brain rewards us with dopamine to try and make the behaviors happen again so say like exercise a nice simple example you have to put a bit of effort in it might be not that enjoyable at the beginning and then afterwards you feel like that sense of accomplishment and what we've done now is we've thought wow that dopamine stuff feels pretty good so we've made it super accessible without the prior effort basically so what we've done with all the social media and tech and booze and junk food and porn and all these different things that give us these big dopamine hits with no effort they basically lead to our brain going hey, why the hell am i experiencing all this pleasure when i didn't put any kind of journey to get there so then it crashes it out which leaves us feeling very depleted coming to your question with that dopamine understanding when you're wanting to rest you really want to get away from any of these quick hit dopamine ideas because largely when we need rest it's because we've just 
really crashed out this resource. We've had too much time on our computers, checking email, WhatsApp, all these different things. And then we might think, well, I really need a few hours off. And we sit on the sofa watching the TV, scrolling our phone. And that's just, it's not rest. It continues to exhaust the resource. So I think rest can obviously be like full rest, napping and sleeping more is good for the brain. But I think active rest of getting outdoors away from technology and going for walks is so underestimated how valuable that can be. It was the biggest game changer in my whole mental health journey and understanding and then getting into more creative spaces for my work and all of those things was just leaving my phone at home or if I had to bring it putting it on an airplane and putting it in my backpack and just spending like at first I found it quite unusual like being in the quiet because I just hadn't done it in so long 10 minutes then 20 minutes then 30 minutes and that's like active rest where you're getting the sunlight you're getting the nature benefits the movement benefits and this dopamine stuff is just recharging like crazy because it's not getting used up yeah no, I totally hear you on that. And one of the benefits of last year, I think for a lot of people, was because our amount of time outside was restricted, we made mm-hmm. sure that we used it. And we would get, you know, I went on more walks last year than probably my entire life combined, right? <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Which was really interesting. And you know what? As the world's opened back up, I've let that habit drop. And thinking mm. about it, I mean, it's just so so fundamentally human to get out into the outdoors, into the quiet, get the fresh air in, get moving, isn't it? Hey, everybody. Sorry to interrupt the podcast, but I wanted to tell you very quickly about how Executive Career Jump can help end your career misery. So when you hit our website, there's three different ways that our digital resources can help you. For a start, if you're looking to jump in to a new role, we've got the premier online job search course that you're going to find anywhere. There's a number of different memberships to help you understand what you want and how to go and get it in this current environment. So we're here to help you if you want a new career. We've also got a a section if you want to jump up in your career. And so this is all about our online leadership hub, which is a platform full of content, includes uh, two meetups per quarter and a whole thriving community of leaders trying to become the best leaders they can be. Go and check that out too. And the third area in our website and the other digital course that might help you is our business launcher course. So we've created the business launcher program that we wish we had when we were setting up on their own. So if you've decided to jump off of the employment stream and start up on your own, make sure you head over and check that out too. You can find all of these resources, a bunch of free content, links to previous podcasts and more at execcareerjump.com. That's E-X-E-C careerjump.com. Now, Back to the pod. So when you're trying to help people make a shift, whether or not it's with rest or other areas of well-being and mental health, how do you help them create and maintain better habits so that these things don't fall off? Yeah, that's a good question. And this is one of the slight challenges we have with the whole kind of well-being mental health space now. It's because it's so big. There is so much advice. There's so much guidance. It's all really fantastic guidance and advice online. But it can mean that you kind of scroll your phone, you see all these different things that you might need to do. You think, oh, that'd be good. Oh, that probably makes you feel better. That'd be good. And it ends up being like so much that you do nothing. And I think that's the state of mind I think lots of people find themselves in. They know it's important, but the choice is too big. Just like the nightmare of trying to pick a movie on Netflix. It's a difficult thing to do these days because we've got too much choice. So what I would always guide people to do is really select one and maybe maximum two things they're going to approach for like a two or three week period so a lot of the time I guide people to really start considering what their relationship is like with their phone because I think that the phone is very influential on the experience we have for tons and tons of reasons and I then guide them to really consider why they were doing that so why would I want to create a better relationship with my phone is it because you want to feel more driven is it because you want your mind to be less busy do you want to feel less anxious less stressed more focused, whatever the kind of key driver for that person is in their life. And then with that in mind, start really thinking for the next two weeks, I'm going to nail this. I'm going to not go on my phone immediately when I wake up and I'm going to observe my screen time and see if I can slightly reduce it. And I'm going to reduce the frequency of checking. The frequency of checking this stuff is really what exhausts our mind because every time the dopamine starts to climb back up, we check it again and we check it again. It never gets a chance to build. So I'd like to say, select one maximum two really try and nail it for a few weeks observe the impact and then build in another practice so that you can begin to isolate oh, okay that thing is really valuable for me whether it's a shift in diet or exercise or nature or phone whatever it may be 
Absolutely. Thank you. I think that makes sense. Well, I think what we tend to do is the New Year's resolution of we're going to turn into the perfect human overnight. <laughs> yeah. um, and we try maybe seven or eight new things at once, don't we? A hundred percent. I think if you can select one New Year's resolution and it can be so simple, it can just be for this, I'm going to move more, or I'm going to shift up my diet or reduce booze or whatever it may be. Selecting one and just attacking it. And also whenever you're creating a shift in a habit not feeling like it has to be perfect and you can't slip up because a lot of the time people think like i'm going to eat really healthy go super healthy for like a week 10 days then they make one error and they think oh actually now i can't be bothered with that diet thing and they go completely back and i think really understanding that humans just do slip up you always slip up i understand this phone stuff pretty well and i still check it all the time like i still am building that relationship so Having like a direction you want to go in, understanding that you may deviate from that direction, but you're always heading towards it, I think is the key. Yeah, excellent. And that's a lovely contract, actually, because I mentioned before we started recording, one of the content topics that I've seen you post on that I think is really interesting is the fact that we're so hard on ourselves. Mm. And I think that's what's going on underneath what you've just said. So talk to us about that. What, why are we so hard on ourselves and what can we do about it? Yeah, this is a huge component of mental health and the general experience we have in our life i feel like the conversation we're having with ourselves in our mind is like right at the core of everything how we're approaching getting a new job or our work or whether we're going to integrate a new habit whatever it may be it all starts with how you're chatting to yourself in your head about that issue and it is very difficult in our world now because our minds do have a big tendency to tell us off. They like to criticize us and judge us. And I do think that has been massively, massively exacerbated through social media because of the constant observation of everyone's highlights in their experience, which like I love LinkedIn. Like it's awesome seeing everything that people are doing. That's fantastic. And you see a lot of it. And then you go on Instagram and you see the highlights of the fun people are having because largely when you're doing something that's exciting or you achieve something, that's when you put it on social media. Of course, you have slight deviations in that, but that's pretty much what social media is. And when we're constantly observing people getting healthier or fitter or more successful, it can really create a narrative in our head whereby we think, wow, I'm not doing as well. I'm not good enough. I'm not working hard enough. I don't look good enough, whatever it may be. And starting to actively observe that conversation is really really important because i think for many people this is happening like underneath the covers but it is it is there and people know they're being hard on themselves but they haven't actually witnessed it happening they kind of just feel that's how they communicate with themselves and this is back to getting away from the phone and going on the walks this was the biggest thing i noticed because i'd be walking a lot and i'd kind of be telling myself off for something not doing well enough with work whatever it may be and then I was doing this day in, day out, thinking, wow, I'm just not communicating myself very nicely here. Like, I am putting in loads of effort to my life, I'm trying to make progress here, and I'm only highlighting the negatives. And I started thinking, well, I'm going to go on these walks every day, because I kind of, that was the thing that, that was my objective at that point. So I started being like, well, how could I actually make this an enjoyable experience so that I don't have to hate this 30 minutes every day that I'm walking along? And then I was thinking, what is the best way to do this? And what I started to do was just actively recognize and list out any of the progress I was making. So when my mind was suddenly going, well, you're not good enough for this, you're not hard, working hard enough, just being hard on yourself, I started trying to counter it with, well, that's the progress I've made in that area and that's the contribution I've made in that area and that's how that's been materializing. And I started active recognition because our minds are inevitably going to focus on the negatives. We live in a society that very much is oriented towards negativity in terms of like media and news and i know that's kind of how it has to be structured but i do think that definitely plays a part and then how our mind operates because the news doesn't very often be like wow look at all the amazing things we're achieving it's more the other side and it's quite hard on us as a society so i think because that's the case if you're struggling with that and it's something that resonates i think each day actively recognizing maybe at the end of your working day thinking, okay, what did I do today that's moved me forward? Listing out a few of those things and thinking, wow, that's actually pretty good. So rather than, God, I still got so much to do and I'm not where I want to be. It's like, oh, I've done this stuff. I'm making progress. And that shift begins to make your mind more comfortable with being a bit kinder, a bit more compassionate to yourself. And then over time, you begin to notice it just happening on its own effectively. No, oh, I absolutely love that. That's tremendous insights. 
it is interesting that we're so much harder on ourselves than others. Like we try and help some of our clients at times reframe what they're saying to themselves and actually say, what would I say to a really close friend? Mm, yeah. You know, what advice would you give your son, daughter, brother or sister about the problem that you're grappling with? Like, what would you say to them? And it's people are always so much more positive outwardly than they are inwardly. It's a real shame. Yeah, it's so true. And I think it's very interesting because if you use that example, like we are so loving to one another. And like when someone's having a tough time with their work or something, we're like, oh, well, you are doing great because you can objectively observe the effort that that individual is putting in. But I don't think we internally recognize our own effort. So it's easier to be like, but you are doing really well or you do look good or whatever it may be. So I think that's a good example, starting to just think, would I actually say this to someone else? And I think the best thing to do is really in the moment that it's happening and you are saying unkind things, stopping, like getting away from like your phone and your computer and not actually trying to stop the thoughts, like allowing the conversation to continue, but rather be like witnessing the thoughts rather than being in the thoughts. And then you start to think, wow, that's how I constructed that conversation. And then you can kind of train yourself to reconstruct it in a different way. And over time, you can reconstruct them all and start living a little bit nicer in your head. Yeah, and this compare and despair problem that social media serves us up every day is a massive issue, isn't it? Huge. So, so what kind of advice do you give people? Like social media is here, right? There's no point pretending the digital world is going to go anywhere soon. We're in, this is the world we now operate in. There's no doubt about that. You and I both run active pages on various platforms and you know it's the ecosystem that we all operate in. So what advice do you give people in terms of how to get the best out of social media without paying a big price personally? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question and a good way to frame it as well, because I just, I think social media also has a lot of value. There's a lot of interesting stuff on there and it definitely, as you say, it's here to stay. And as a society, we have just got to figure out how to psychologically manage it because it obviously is having a big impact. In terms of how to navigate it, I think the biggest thing we can do is learn to actively influence the algorithm in a positive way for us. So algorithms are very, they're very intelligent systems. And one of the difficulties with social media is everyone kind of has their insecurities, whether it's about your work, your success, your looks, your friendships, how much fun you have. Everyone has things they feel slightly insecure about. And you'll probably therefore spend more time with your eyes looking at those posts and how social media works it's obviously it's not just likes and comments the system really knows how long you're spending on each post and how much you're reading and how it, whether you're reading comments and it knows everything like that and what's difficult is typically social media will help us to identify an insecurity if you take like a simple example of like a, a girl feeling like she needs to lose weight and then going on social media suddenly seeing people that are overweight people that are really thin and then dietary supplements and then it like really exacerbates this challenge in their mind with that in mind, we can also do the opposite. We can start actively being on social media and constructing a feed that does feel like it makes us feel better than it makes us feel worse. And this is something I've been doing for a, a number of months where if I see a post and it makes me feel like I compare myself to them and it makes me feel stressed out and low, I could just click the three dots and click like hide. If it's something to do with like looks or someone's success, whatever it may be, and then on the alternative side, so you try and get rid of the stuff that's maybe not serving you. And then when you see stuff that's really good, like I really like educational cooking videos. I'm not a cook, but I have literally cooked so many new meals as a result of social media. My girlfriend, I love doing, we'll see a video and we're like, oh, cool. That's another new meal we can make. So that's something that's good. And when you see posts that you think, oh, it made me feel quite good, really engage with it. Click favorite on it or like it or comment on it or just, hold for a second and read through it or watch it because then the algorithm will start to just feed you stuff that makes you feel better so the time that you spend on social is actually serving you rather than taking away tremendous yeah curate your own feed effectively through where you place your clicks and comments and eyeballs right 100 percent. very important no i absolutely love that That's some fantastic guidance now a lot of our audience tj are going through some kind of career transition it's mm -hmm. a really tough time for them it's kind of like a grieving process in many ways Mm. when you're made redundant or you lose your role and you didn't see it coming and more than ever people have been experiencing this over the last couple of years i wonder with what you know about the mind 
if someone that you cared about got made redundant, came to you and said, hey, TJ, can we grab a coffee? And then said to you, look, I've just been made redundant. I'm really struggling. What advice would you give to somebody going through that kind of process that you cared about? Yeah, that's a great question. I think referring to it as grieving is on the money. And that, that definitely is the direction I'd go in. I think it's really significant losing a job. Like it's really our livelihood and it's responsible for so many things in our lives. And it is a big hit to your whole system. So the first piece of advice I'd give them is actually allow them to experience it because a lot of the time, we go into these situations and, and it creates a lot of stress and a lot of panic, a lot of like adrenaline, all these different things. And we think, oh, I've got to solve this fast. Like I need a new job. I've got to get one. I've got to start looking online or interviews or whatever it may be. And in the process, we haven't really got through the other job loss psychologically and in our body. And then we start just making the system even busier and even more stressed. So Although it might be like, oh, I can't give myself a week to let this sit in me or whatever it may be. I think in terms of the speed in which you'll find yourself in a new job and be able to be in a good headspace for the interviews or whether it's starting a new job, starting a new company, whatever it may be, we really need to allow ourselves to experience loss. And this is what you see with so many people. They don't let themselves kind of experience the loss of their mom or their parent or whatever it may be. And they like hold the emotion and then that continues to hit them for a very long time. So I think allowing yourself to feel the frustration, feel the stress, understand why you're annoyed, really in that period, prioritize a lot of things that could support you. So not work stuff, but the nature and the food and the movement and the time away from your phone and the time with people allow yourself to feel it, prioritize those things. And I think you'd find yourself in a new job, probably in a more efficient way. Yeah, absolutely right. You definitely, the, the old adage of needing to process the change seems to be yeah. very true. And in a, I understand why people jump straight into the search from a position of anxiety, but what they tend to do is then, is then interview poorly and mm. receive more rejection at a time that they're already feeling fragile. So I think it's great guidance to kind of, anchor in a little bit experience what you're experiencing it will pass it always does and allow it to pass and then get clarity and, and go to market when you're ready i think that's fantastic one thing as well i wanted to ask you about before we get into a few quick fire bits whilst i've got you i've been very open on this podcast myself in terms of the challenge that i have with sleep and that many of my mm. friends have many of my friends have a sleep as well it's amazing when you open up how crap at sleeping we are as a population is incredible no doubt the digital piece is part of this and just as you described earlier that overactive mind and that dopamine thing how's your relationship with sleep and what advice do you give other people in terms of getting better at it yeah that's a a good area sleep is big and whenever I go into the sleep thing like a lot of stuff I give people a lot of science and insight as to the importance of it but I always find with sleep we just instinctively know we need it. And when we get less of it, we know the challenge it creates for us. So there are definitely some ideas I have for sleep. And these ideas came from, I actually was someone really struggling with sleep through university. Like I always had to have friends, the TV show, like on in the background on my iPad, like all night, I was churning through that show back and forth because I just always would wake up, couldn't sleep, couldn't fall asleep, whatever it may be. So there are a few different ideas. One thing to recognize in terms of the digital impact is when we're using technology, our brain is working like incredibly, incredibly fast. Like our brain is full of electricity. And if you imagine when you're actually on tech, when you're on your phone and you're texting someone on WhatsApp and then watching a YouTube video and then flicking on something else, your brain is consuming like all the colors, all the sound, all the information. So it's operating at speed. And one of the challenges is when we go to sleep, obviously we need the brain to go fully into rest and it really slows down. It goes deeper into kind of our more primitive brain, which is where all the dreaming and stuff takes place. Often what we do now is we spend all evening on tech, watching TV and probably watching TV whilst we also have our phone in our hand because we're so like addicted to just so stimulation now. And we do that all evening. So the brain's really buzzing. We get into bed. We probably still have our tech with us. And then we put it on the side and then we're like, okay, Right, brain, go to sleep. And it's like, there's no cool down period for the neurons to actually slow down their firing. And then what typically happens is they want to maintain that pace for at least like 30 minutes. They're going to attempt to kind of keep going at the same speed because that's what they got to. Just like if something gets fast, it doesn't stop instantly like a car or whatever it may be. 
So in that part, the phone's not there. Then, because the brain's going really fast, it starts to think at the speed because it's trying to basically maintain the experience it was having, but it doesn't have an external stimulus. So then you start to ruminate and run around your mind. So you start worrying maybe about work or thinking about different things. And that's challenging headspace to find yourself in. So there's two ideas that come out of this. One is having a cool down period where you come off tech before you sleep. And I'm not someone that thinks, right, no tech after 8 p.m. Because I think it's just so unrealistic to suggest those kind of things. But definitely having like starting with at least like 10 minutes where your eyes don't see tech. So come away from the sofa and you think, right, I'll go brush my teeth. I'll get a glass of water. I'll kind of get the room all ready and have like a window where the brain is at least slowing down. Always having the lighting very dark in your house is very good because all this artificial light is very, very confusing for our eyes and this stuff called melatonin. So one thing is a cool down period, super key. The other aspect, which was the complete game changer for my sleep, was charging my phone in another room, which was a very hard habit to break because we like our phone there. It's our alarm. We like to wake up and get our dopamine hit as quickly as we possibly can. However, I'm so sure that we'll learn more about this in time, about energy and humans and stuff. I'm sure that your brain can feel the phone is near you, if, even if you're not interacting with it, because it's obviously going to be emitting some kind of like energetic waves and electricity and stuff. And I'm sure it impacts sleep because I took it out. I got an alarm. And if you're thinking, well, I can't do this because I don't have an alarm. There are these sunrise alarm clocks. I don't know if you've ever seen sunrise alarm clocks. They wake you up over 30 minutes with light instead of sound, which is just heaven for your brain because you don't get alarmed like electrically waking into the, getting into a waking state. You get woken, woken slowly. So charge the phone in another room, have a cool down period. I think those two things can make a, a monster, monster difference. Yeah, absolutely. But I'll have to check out the sunrise alarm clocks. I hadn't heard of that. Yeah, if you search that on Amazon, not to be a... Jeff Bezos marketer, search it anywhere, but Prime is where we typically go. There's actually a brand not associated with them called Lumi, uh, L-U-M-I-E, and they just make really, really good alarm clocks. So I uh, would have a look. Yeah, we certainly will do. Thanks, TJ. I want to do some quick fire stuff then before we wrap. Is that all right with you? Far away. We'll keep you on your toes. Right, so question number one, a quote that you particularly like or resonates? I like the Viktor Frankl between stimulus and response, there is a space and in that space, the power to choose our freedom. Love that. And anyone who hasn't read Man's Search for Meaning, read it, it's a brilliant book. Very good. Speaking of books, any other books other than Man's Search for Meaning that you recommend and like? A hundred percent. There's a new book by the lead of mental illness at Stanford University called Dopamine Nation. Just came out in October. The, the like the biggest universities researching mental health are definitely thinking that dopamine is the biggest cause of this shift. So definitely have a read of that. Understand that we need some spec from dopamine. Love that. Best careers advice or best life advice that you've ever had? Make sure you're really focused on doing something that actually creates like excitement and enthusiasm for you. Like I was on a very different path in my first year of uni. And realized like in a lot of my interviews, it just wasn't the direction I wanted to go in. And I loved psychology and I loved this idea of mental health, but I couldn't see any like potential for income or money. Or I couldn't see where it would go. And I just kind of was like, right, I'm gonna, I like it, so I'm just going to stick with it. And I think focusing on what you enjoy is only going to serve you massively in the long term. Okay, great. And is the word mindset correct? Because based on what you've said, it doesn't seem very set at all. <laughs> Yes, I think it's mind fluid would probably be a, a more appropriate term. Our mind likes to go up and down. And being all right with that is actually a really important part of this. You can't feel good all the time. Love that. And then finally, what are you excited about for 2022? Very excited to launch a, uh, a whole new e-learning training experience for parents to understand how to interact with their kids and their relationship with tech. I think it's a really important area, this teenage social media tech stuff. I think a lot of parents are really struggling with how to navigate it. And we're launching a whole kind of process for them to feel like they understand it better and can relate to them better. Oh, my goodness. I need that. <laughs> and, and I'm sure other people do, too. That is a really I mean, that's a whole other podcast, right? But and yeah, our, our children are nine and six, and it's already a really it's the most difficult part of our relationship with them is the relationship. I can them. imagine. We're hoping to have 
kind of training experiences for all age groups. We're going to have like seven to nine, nine to 11, all the way up through teenage. So I think it's going to be a big 2022 with that. Yeah, no, that's bang on the money in terms of what's needed in the market. I look forward to uh, signing up, exploring that. For anybody else <laughs> who's listening, TJ, who perhaps wants to follow you, reach out to you, what's the best way for them to find you and make contact? Yeah, so LinkedIn and Instagram, those are the two platforms I focus on. And if you just search TJ Power on LinkedIn or Instagram, I should come up quite quickly. I put a lot, a lot of guidance on uh, Instagram specifically. I post five or six times a week on there. Lots of different ways to consume these ideas. Absolutely love that. Well, look, we wish you all the very best with your work. I think you're doing really, really, really meaningful work at a time when we all need it. So thank you for coming on and sharing your insights so generously today. And uh, yeah, have a good festive period. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Andrew. Very, very good questions. I've had a good time. No, please. I've enjoyed it too. Take care, TJ. Cheers. Thank you. You've been listening to the Career Jump podcast with Andrew McCaskill. For more resources and information, just head over to the Career Jump website at www.execcareerjump.com to supercharge your job search and start making moves. Let's get to work. Let's get to work.